Now we're going to go into intellectual property. Um, you can't talk about innovation without talking about uh, intellectual property. And um, we're going to focus on the pharmaceutical industry. I'd like to call on the panelists for, for this session to take their seats. Um, Dino Celeste, managing partner at Clientelis. Um, Kevin Moodley, country head at uh, Hetero Drugs. Uh, David Cochran, partner at Spoor and Fisher and uh, Lubabalo James Nyaka, the CEO of Aflumed. And then lastly, uh, Judy Vendel, Senior Manager at Deloitte. Thanks very much. Morning, everybody. Uh, to start things off, I thought I would just give a practical example of intellectual property rights in a pharmaceutical product. Um, as I walked out of my home today, um, I went to our medicine chest and I got hold of this little uh, bottle of medicine here, which is the product um, Augmentin. This product is uh, protected by patents in, in, in South Africa. Um, and um, interestingly enough, the, the patent, I believe, will be expiring uh, pretty soon on this product. Um, but the other forms of intellectual property in this product, it's obviously the trademark, uh, Augmentin. Um, and then the other form of intellectual property is uh, copyright. And that would be in the label itself um, and also in the, in the package insert. The other forms of uh, intellectual property um, would be uh, the protection of trade secrets and know-how, uh, for example, in the manufacturing of the formulation and, and active ingredients. But then there are also forms of innovation uh, that are not necessarily protectable uh, by intellectual property rights. Um, and I think that's um, in, uh, in South Africa and, and in Africa, one of the challenges for, uh, facing medicines is, is, is the supply uh, of medicine. And I think there is a lot of scope for innovation in the, in the supply of medicines, and these are not necessarily protected by the traditional forms of, of, of intellectual property. Most African countries have um, intellectual property laws. The ability to obtain granted rights and also the enforcement of these intellectual property rights um, differ from country to country. In the past, um, intellectual property rights in South Africa um, have been enforced for, for many years. The countries in the rest of Africa, um, it's becoming easier to get your intellectual property rights granted, and we've seen the enforcement of intellectual property rights, uh, particularly in countries such as uh, Kenya. Against this backdrop, um, I'd like to ask Kevin, as the country head of, research driven, of a research-driven pharmaceutical company, um, what do you think are the advantages of strong IP protection, and in particular patent protection, uh, in South Africa and, and the rest of Africa. I'm Kevin, I'm just a country head of Aviator Drugs um, South Africa, it's an Indian based um, company. Just a little story if, if from an Indian perspective, uh, there was a company, uh, India Drugs Pharmaceuticals, that was founded in 1965. And they, the main focus was around API and Finnish formulation. And uh, they, made, they really made big strides into the market eventually became the biggest uh, pharmaceutical company in, uh, in India. And what emanated the, all the top and years of the big uh, players in South Africa, the Dr. Reddy's, Albindo's, and Vaxis, emanated from that, that company as well. So, and they, that, that was their focus from an R&D perspective where they formulated their own API and finished formulation. Now, as you know, in South Africa, there's a lack of technology from that perspective. We don't have the expertise, we don't have the technology to, to formulate our own API and of course uh, and the finished formulation and that's uh, part of your intellectual property where there are patents attached to it as well as Derek uh, mentioned earlier. So we have a, which we call the HRF, it's a Atrial Research Foundation where we, we, we formulate and synthesize our own API and we have about 300 products as well, um, globally, that um, intellectual property and about 100 of those products are on, under patent. From an innovation perspective, what we actually do in South Africa, I started this office in 2008 as a founder. I realized that we have problems with APIs in South Africa, specifically around the, the products that are on the EDL, which is ARVs, um, the European TB drugs. And that's our forte, you know, ARVs specifically. So there are quite a few players in the market, in local players, that obviously want to, to be in that space as well. You know, because 
of the pandemic that's uh, transpiring at the moment. Uh, but because of the, the multinationals that have the patent laws uh, that we implemented with their products, it was difficult for the local players to, to tap into that, uh, those markets and, and get into the space. But from a retro perspective, what we did was we said, if well, we would support, from a genetic side of it, we would support the local players as well. What we were thinking, and my idea, a recommendation is with support of government in South Africa, we should focus and look at, at having an API facility, because without API, uh, you can't manufacture a product. And API constitutes about 60% of the cost of goods. And uh, obviously, we, we thought we will um, speak to government and, and see what, what and, and they should now actually focus on an R&D facility to formulate that and the, the API specifically because as you, you must have read in the, in the newspapers that of late there were shortages of product and the reason why there were shortages of products was because of API shortages. So once they uh, focus on that and manufacturing and also to develop um, the different skills that's required for that, specifically around pharmacists and, and the pharmacists that, that graduate from our, our, our universities, to bring in skills to, to, to educate them and train them to be part of that adventure. That to me is an innovation. On top of that, it's also the marketing side of it, to take those products uh, to market. Um, we know we have the likes of Adcox and the big players that have a good uh, marketing infrastructure as, as well. So, and that model, I think, will work to be work well, and it will be commercially viable. And with that innovation, we can then roll it out into Africa, because as we know, South Africa is the gateway to Africa. Okay. And um, and Etro is, and we we really equipped to do that from a technical perspective as well. We were uh, actually involved in the David in the, and if you recall, and the most <coughs> probably many people around here will recall the Ketlapera project. We were looking at setting up an API facility with Lonza a few years back, but they pulled out of it. And, and we were approached to be a technical partner, <coughs> but in, at that time, Naledi uh, Pando was um, the Minister of the Department of Science and Technology. Now it's being resurrect, resurrected now again. So that's a, that, that's a good uh, initiative, and I think that will, will help because you must be in mind with, from an API perspective, all those products, uh, APIs are important. And with the economic climate, this is all US dollar based. Now you know what's happening with exchange. And specifically given the ARV tenders now of late. Uh, they, when the, uh, the players tendered, it was at about 1070, right? And now sitting at about 12, 50, close to 13. So you can see the difference. So they, currently, they, they are actually bleeding, the, the players. And what's a lady obviously advocated the single pull, as we all know. Uh, instead of taking 20 pills, you just pop to one pill, and that's a triple E, a TEE. So those type of initiatives, we, we think that we can support um, um, the government, together with government. But government needs to buy in, because you, and the funders are, as well, because you need capital to be injected for those type of, of, of projects, and, and funders as uh, IDC a, as well. So, um, and we should also encourage uh, clinic, clinical trials in South Africa as, as well, you know, and then invite renowned players from a chemical perspective from, from, from abroad to, to come out. But those are all government initiatives, you know, and then uh, and, and just map out a way forward with that in place in South Africa. Once we have it bedded down in South Africa, mm. then we can roll it out into Africa. So that's where I see, I see the benefit, you know. And, and, and going back to your, um, the patent issue, um, obviously, with those products, the as high up and ARVs, uh, TB, malaria, you you are allowed to get voluntary licenses from this from the innovators, and from government the compulsory uh, licenses a, as well. You know, so yes, there are advantages to be to from specific, uh, the multinationals. Years ago, came in that uh, through through with, with the patents. I mean, they they saw benefit from a security perspective from a first to market perspective, you know. So they were, they were sort of commercially creaming it, so to speak, you know. And then you only have the one play if it's, if it's a top product in, in, in the market. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we have genetics, we have a few more players, 
So it would be to the government's advantage or, or to the Department of Health to be, not to be in an out-of-stock situation, mm. you know. So that's where I see uh, um, the, the way forward, you know. And, 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 and one, there are barriers as well that we need to, to break through. And those barriers to me are the registration authorities, mm. where there's products sitting there, right? And to me, what's important is to get products to the patient. Product that goes through the to the MCC, they're doing maybe doing a good job, but the products are just not being being registered, and they are top products. And those top products, the ARVs and the malaria, those are the type of products that's supposed to be fast track because of the pandemic that's happening at the moment. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, most companies in South Africa, the local players, they work in silos. I think they should collaborate more and, and, and take on, you know, try to break through these barriers. And take on the MCC. Yeah. So if, if I understand that correctly then um, r rather than focusing on developing new drugs in, in South Africa yeah. you're suggesting that what um, the local companies should, should start off by doing is um, developing the manufacturing capabilities yeah. for generic products yeah. um, in particular for um, that are necessary for, yeah. for, for public health and, even from, and from that in itself is, is a form of, of, of innovation. Yeah. And even from, from a government perspective to, to set up an R&D facility. Mm where they can formulate their own IPI, mm. because that's, that's the main issue. Yeah. And you know, with so many players coming from India, from China, at a high cost. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and of course, it's exacerbated by the, by the, the economic climate. Yeah. So, yeah. Judy, we were chatting earlier um, about research and development on uh, new pharmaceutical products, APIs, in, uh, in, in South Africa. Um, we, we know that um, there's very little of that going on. I don't know if you've got some comments on that. Well, I think there's an opportunity around R&D in particular. I think, just to go back on one step, I mean, there's a big desire from a South African point of view to move away from kind of the heavy manufacturing type skill set to having more of a, a, a knowledge-based economy. And if you look at that from a global perspective, one of the key kind of industries that drives that is the pharmaceutical sector. And if you look at that, it's largely driven by two things. One is, is the research and development, and the other is on the technical manufacturing of, of product. And I think if you look at a number of policies that exist um, through, through a number, I'll name three of them, the DST, DTI, and Department of Health, they all have a common desire to, to grow that sector as a whole. And I think what we, we land up with is a little bit of a balance between how do we how do we provide access so more people can get access to these products, but also how do we protect our IP? And I have a personal view that I think there's an opportunity that we could create some form of a, of a special, special purpose vehicle for us to be able to invest in, 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 in the research development of new products within South Africa. Now, I want to take one step back on that, and, and, and if you look at it, the DST has already... Uh, published quite a, a comprehensive policy around we have a, a, around the the fauna and flora that we have access to. There is a lot of anecdotal um, evidence at the moment that they have a, a huge impact into the dread diseases that that exist. But we have a desire to do more research into the neglected diseases, and that in itself pr provides quite a quandary because the research and development is not a quick process. And if we're going to invest into the research and development, the people doing that want to at least make a return on that investment in some way. But we have this need to look into these neglected diseases. And if we could get some form of a special purpose vehicle whereby we could look after protecting the intellectual property that we're generating through that research and development so that we maintain the IP, be that as a nation or be that as an SPV, we can then earn some rights off those products where we're sending in for the neglected diseases and use the revenue that we're making of that to then go and fund research into the, dr the, the, sorry, the dread diseases into the neglected diseases. So is there a different way that we could deal with that whole research and development um, question that, that exists? And I think you know, it comes a lot around looking at things differently. SHIPS is doing very well in research and development. They're starting to get a lot of collaboration between the universities. So instead of having isolated research 
of similar research happening at a number of universities that's saying you can't get funding unless you guys start to collaborate. So we started in that process, and I think once we drive that, with research and development come all your stages. I won't go through all the stages of research, but ultimately you've got to start with a little manufacturing plant. Absolutely. And with that little manufacturing plant, you've now started to generate the, the, the knowledge, etc., within the country, and that then grows out into the bigger plants, etc. So then, then that. It's not a quick turnaround. API continues to be expensive. We all know what's happened to emerging economy currencies. So it, it, it's going to create quite a quandary, I think, for, for everybody in terms of access to medicine. So hopefully that gives a view just on, in terms of opportunities around R&D. Um, and I will say I don't just limit this just to pharma, by the way. I think across the clinical spectrum, whether you're talking medical devices, telemedicine, etc., there's a lot of opportunity. Yes, yeah, so I think that's quite an interesting t take on it, um, where um, being able to get IP rights and can commercialize those rights um, over dread the, the dread diseases, and then using the proceeds from that in order to, to, to fund uh, further development into the neglected diseases. Mm. Um, do you know, um, you are in a bit of a different space when it comes to, to innovation uh, in Africa, and I just wonder if you can give us some of your experiences okay. and thoughts. Uh, one of the challenges in terms of R&D for the pharma industry on the continent is, is number one, uh, the fragmented regulatory environment. We have as many regulatory agencies than countries in Africa, meaning 54. The MCC being the South African one, but the national called the NAVDAC, and so on and so on. So when you compare this to markets such as USA or EU, where you have one single regulatory agency, you can, you can imagine the difference of, of, of cost and, 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 and also in terms of speed. So Africa had uh, quite uh, a hard uh, regulatory environment to navigate in. And it's also slow. It's also poorly financed. Even South Africa being the richer country in Africa, even the MCC is poorly financed, actually, when you compare to other agencies in the first world. This is the first thing. And R&D need strong regulatory agency, actually, because one of the main uh, vector of, of R&D for pharmaceutical industry is uh, clinical trials. So we have been tr trying to avo advocate big pharma uh, to bring trials on the continent. And, but one of the challenges is uh, that they have, and most of the trials are multi-country trials. You, 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 you don't have a trial in one country. Many is multi-countries. Therefore, you have to go through each uh, regulatory agencies to, 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 to have your trial being reviewed. And uh, the, rev the, the reviews are, are slow on, on, on top, so it makes it quite difficult. Having said that, uh, Africa got a, a double burden of diseases. We, do, we have both what we call infectious diseases and communicable diseases, and we have also have lifestyle diseases. Uh, we've seen in the past five years a kind of uptick of clinical trial happening in Africa on uh, infectious diseases from malaria vaccines uh, and malaria, malaria drugs as HIV AIDS vaccine and drugs uh, and also uh, right now where I'm talking we have two clinical trials on uh, two Ebola vaccine candidates uh, in seven African countries mainly Central and West Africa and and the, the trials are quite successful they are in the phase three and the a vaccine might be available next year to eradicate completely the pandemic of Ebola on the continent so it's a good example of that the pharma industry is trying to come to the party starting with infectious diseases and what we call tropical diseases, but the, 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 the goal is to build capacity on the continent because research needs capacity in terms of inv inv investigative centers, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of logistics, because when you do clinical trial, you have to be able to move uh, clinical trial samples and blood samples to what we call the central uh, data management center so we need logistics, we need airplane, we need all this call chain try, try type of uh, logistics has to be in place. So hopefully we believe that uh, in the future, uh, the African continent, including South Africa, will be able to, 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 to welcome uh, and, and manage clinical trial on lifestyle diseases. Actually, lifestyle diseases are the one where the big pharma make the more money, uh, in particular oncology. 
I mean, there is, uh, there is a big uh, uh, incidence of oncology and cancer in Africa, and we would like to see more uh, oncology trial happening on the continent. Um, but currently, where this year we have about 200 trials happening in Africa. South Africa uh, take uh, accounts for about 80 percent of the trials happening on the continent. It means that only 20 percent happening in the rest of Africa. And I know a little bit of also about uh, the Middle East, and you have the same picture in the Middle East, whereby Israel take 80 percent of the trial happening in the Middle East. So there is a lot of room of progress for the rest of Africa to, to, to manage clinical trials and, 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 and to have their system in place to uh, motivate uh, big pharma and also not only big pharma, big pharma now work with uh, the CROs, the clinical research organizations, which are big companies listed in New York, which actually manage trial for on their behalf worldwide. So the CROs has to see also progress in terms of regulatory environment in African countries. But the last five years, we've seen CROs who had a base here in South Africa for, for a couple of decades, opening offices in Kenya, in Ghana, in Ethiopia, what we call Middle Africa. So it's a, it's a good move. They're coming close to the investigating centers, which will enable actually them to, to promote some African countries to be included into the country mix of the clinical trials. So I would like also to mention the fact that uh, and a lot of Western powers has had undermined the, the BRICS story. And Africa is South Africa is embarked into a BRIC type of BRIC strategy. And this BRIC story uh, makes that policy, and in particular R&D policy, IP policies in South Africa is being influenced by also same policies in India, in Brazil, in Russia, in China. And coming to pharma in the BRICS set of countries, India got a lead because India is a big uh, uh, global pharmaceutical hub, mm -hmm. uh, not only generics but also innovative medicines. Uh, India got a big pool of scientists and, and pharmacists, industrial, industrial pharmacists. So among the five countries of the BRICS, India got a lead. And What's happening in India in terms of intellectual property and clinical trials might or could influence South Africa, for instance, uh, in a negative way for the big pharma because, I don't know, I guess, Kevin, you're aware of that. Uh, last two years, uh, the Indian government uh, has taken a policy to, uh, which actually impact on clinical trials happening in India. India used to be a big country of clinical trial. Uh, the Indian government made a policy increasing the liabilities of big pharma in terms of uh, clinical trial outcomes. Uh, and then the, the big, a lot of big pharma pulled the trial out of India <coughs> to, to, to avoid this risk of litigations. And then so th this could be an opportunity for a country like South Africa or for the continent actually to take those trial on and, and to have them happen in Africa. So, the many challenges, I think that we have to look at this in a very uh, different perspective. There is an Africa agenda, there is a BRICS agenda. Those two agendas might not be aligned always. And in our, in our domain, intellectual property and R&D, this might be the case. Maybe, Kevin, you can say more about that. From my side, it is a, a bit different because our focus is on innovation around um, lifestyle disease management. We realize that there is a lack of regulation and there's also lack of proper regulation along that side. For example, we're focusing on diabetes and hypertension. We've realized that um, due to lack of uh, clinicians, there's less um, time spent with uh, patients. As a result, they know they diagnose of diabetes, but they don't even know what that is. Now it becomes difficult for them to take this disease serious because they don't know the complications, because not feeling sick until the last days we actually see that the complications are manifesting. So what we're actually doing now, we're focusing on imaging markets. With the imaging markets, what they told at the moment is take medication, exercise, and eat healthy. But you know that um, a one-size-fits-all approach to nutrition, it doesn't work. It, we, it, it has been proven a number of times. Exercise, once again, what, what do you mean by exercise? So those things are not explained to them. So our program is around that. Integration of that with medication as well. We know the economy as well around uh, emerging markets that it's difficult for them to actually afford branded uh, pharmaceuticals. So their main um, medication that they get is generics. But with the generics, there's just tons of them that are available. I understand that there are good generics and there are bad ones, but especially 
the ones that they get through Medipost. They don't know which month they're going to get this one, and then the following month it's a different brand. So I believe there is also a need for regulation there. So we focus on that. We're hoping government will actually take our initiative seriously so that there can be a sort of regulation there. What you're looking at there are, are, are types of innovation that are not necessarily protected by patents or copyrights or <coughs> trademarks, but um, truly innovative ways of um, treating people. Yes, indeed. Yeah. One question that I would like to ask the, the, the panel, does intellectual property open the doors to access to medicines? Um, bearing in mind patents are often or can be referred to as limiting access to medicines. Um, and obviously we've had some, uh, well, we know that we've got the South African uh, draft intellectual uh, property policy, uh, which talks about um, having a balance between health and um, intellectual property. And I'd like to know whether our panel has got any views on that. I mean, access in itself has, has a number of definitions. It's not mm. just the price that's necessarily access, it's the ability to access the, the healthcare system itself, be that actual physical locations and all people. Mm. So I think that there, there is a balance, and, and, and coming back to the point I was making earlier around, we don't want to stop R&D into the diseases of the future. I mean, we as South Africa are starting to produce a, a, a lot of R&D into a very specific form of cancer that is likely to be coming out in the future. We don't want to stop that. We don't want to stop our growth into, into being that intellectual economy that we need to. But mm. there is this, this, this need to balance the amount of, that is being spent on research and development and the ultimate super profits, I think, that, mm. that potentially were being made in the future. I don't think we want to stop necessarily that R&D from being able to allow those organizations to continue doing what they're doing and make a reasonable profit because that's what we want in terms of taxes for the country. But I think there is a balance between how and where, where you do that. And I think this is where we've got to start thinking differently. And, and I think, sorry to bring in the, the, the sort of very big word public-private partnership because it means a lot of things to different people. <coughs> where is it that we can get more partnerships working so that we can benefit both as a nation but also as, as patients who access the, the system. I try to explain the, the big pharma mind, how it works. It's very relevant to them because they won't invest in a country in terms of R&D <coughs> whereby they don't see market access mm -hmm. being made available. Mm -hmm. uh, you see what I mean? It's a kind of, you know, a kind of, I want to say blackmail, it's a kind of try to negotiation. So if I invest, because uh, you know that LRD costs is very, are very expensive. If I invest LRD in a country, I expect this country, through their health insurance system, either is a national one or is a private one, like here, is being able to, to give uh, uh, ability to pay for my drugs. So, so I want a return on investment. So then they have two strategies about, about that. Either they say, okay, this country is not willing to open the market access wide, so I'm going to press my drug in this country. Very expensive, but I will sell small volumes, so I have, I have a, a, a high margin, small volume type of strategy. Or I, I'm saying this country actually is trying to make a wide access to my drugs uh, to push my price down, make it more reasonable, but having a bigger volume. So. Mm -hmm. It plays the role in terms of the decision to invest in R and D in a country yeah. from a big pharma type of mindset. Yeah. Mm. And just on that as well, David. I mean, the, the DOH and and governments advocate in genetics, and as rightfully what, what Dino said, it, they're driving down prices, which it makes it difficult for the manufacturer to manufacture those type of products. Mm. And over and above that, the the now wanting to close the gap, there's a pricing between the private market and mm -hmm. public sector. Mm -hmm. So whereas the companies, the local companies, you see the benefit more in the private market because of the margins. <coughs> and now, because there's so many players for, from the public sector, they're not seeing those type of margins that they used to see those years or previously, because mm -hmm. more players that participate in the tenders, and hence they're just doing it for recoveries to the factory. When they used to make 25% margins in the public sector, now they're making 2% yeah. margins hypothetically speaking. But in the private sector, they make 75 to 65 to 70% margins that yeah. offset what they lost in the public sector. Yeah. But now, because they're trying to close the gap, it's going to make it more and more difficult for local players to supply. And now what's happening is most of the local companies are now investing offshore. 
the supplying product to Latin America, mm -hmm. Australia, the rest of the world. Yeah. And with the result, the local players here and the patients of Africa are feeling it. Yeah, sure. That's, yeah. That's something to be really aware of. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 a, it's, it's a huge challenge. Yeah. I mean, David's worth picking up on a couple of things. I think, firstly, we have a number of incentives that promote both R&D and manufacture within South Africa. <laughs> the, the challenge around it is there has been, until recently, a, a disjunct between the R&D investment that you're doing and SARS actually paying you back in, in that. So th there's, there's some of those complexities in terms of we just need a little bit more of a kind of a whole of state approach around that. Um, the second is around manufacturing. We, we used to be a big economy in terms of manufacturing of pharmaceuticals. We lost out of that when, when there was rationalization that happened around the world. Not because we weren't good at it, it's just that we weren't the most attractive at that point in time. Now with the, the Department of Health moving increasingly towards designation, i.e. having to have some form of local manufacture, there is this drive to then now reintroduce manufacturing into certain parts of, 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 of the, the value chain. Whether it has to go straight from API or whether you can go from API through to packaging and inserting here remains open to debate because the API, as you, as you say, still remains the most expensive part of it. But I think the one big thing around manufacturing, and we do a lot of work around assisting um, organizations start manufacturing here. So again, to come back to the incentives, you need to do things in, in the right order to be able to, 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 to benefit from those, those, those incentives that the government offers. But South Africa does not have the same population as a number of the other BRICS countries. And I think it's a very important thing that we keep saying we, could, we must manufacture. Absolutely fine with that. But we do not have the volume of patience to make that financially sustainable. So therefore, any part of any manufacturing process that has to come here has to have a very clear export focus. You have to understand what those markets are that you are going to attend, and then therefore what accreditation that, that, that needs to be applied in that. Yeah. So coming back to your point around this, this challenge around the... the um, regulatory bodies and approvals, etc. If we could get some sort of mutual recognition with the likes of the FDA, etc., that would help us as not just South Africa, but Africa be able to compete in that space to be able to to, to um, be able to export our products. So it, it adds an additional layer of cost to, to your actual manufacturing process, be it pharma, be it made devices. But you know, if we don't do that, then we can't export. If we can't export, then it does make it very, very difficult to make ends meet in, in, on our population alone. One example, I guess, where ICT could play a role in uh, R&D and uh, pharmaceutical on the continent is, I come back to clinical trials. Uh, you know that in the rest of Africa, you, have, you could have investigating centers being far away from uh, capital cities and logistics could be a problem. And there is an opportunity now uh, to, I don't know how many vendors of uh, um, patient record uh, information or hospital information system in the womb, but I guess there is an opportunity now for what we call ECM, ECMTS, uh, Electronic uh, Clinical Trial Management System. Uh, in, in short, it's a, a software or an application tools which enable uh, a central uh, King Cat organization to monitor uh, different trials in different countries remotely and to support uh, the different innovation centers in the different areas. It could be with the Ebola, for instance, for Ebola vaccine, uh, we have uh, centers in rural areas, in very rural areas with difficult access. So to be able to monitor those trials across the continent remotely from, for instance, from a Johannesburg-based King Cultural Organization. So this, this type of tools are on demand. I don't know in the room, the, you've got companies able to develop and design those tools, but it's, it's an example. Just from my point of view, I think as a, as a patent attorney, I'm, I'm, I'm always so focused on um, intellectual property and innovation around the actual medicines themselves. Um, but I think intellectual property and innovation is, um, in the pharmaceutical area is, is much, much bigger than that, uh, particularly when it comes to um, the uh, technological solutions and advantages that things like ICT um, can provide. Uh, from my side, uh, we've noticed that there is a number of counterfeit medication in South Africa. If maybe on the ICT side, they can maybe develop sort of like 
home test devices that uh, patients are able to test their medication that they get, that is the legit medication, that would be a great improvement because at the moment we have over 3.5 uh, 3 million South Africans that are diabetic. These guys are on treatment, but only less than 10% are actually controlled. There are tons of uh, money uh, pushed in that regard, but nothing is actually happening, so I believe there is a need for that so that they know what they're taking. 100%. I think an anti comforting strategy on the continent in Africa is very important. I think that Kevin. Yeah, would, absolutely. Hi, just uh, a question from just up the road here. There's uh, uh, Professor Papathanasopoulos. Her team are basically looking at uh, AIDS research and developing a cure. Um, she's in the, one of the most recent articles uh, that was published earlier this year, late last year. Uh, she was given uh, the, from the ethics committee uh, to move her pharmaceutical product into the primates, uh, making her the leading researcher in the world. Now, my question is this, is why as a South African born solution is she now having, you would think that they were flocking to her door, uh, you know, offering research and development and all this intellectual property to protect it and make it, a, make it South African owned. Um, she had to take it to another country to get sponsorship. Why is that the case? Um, and where do you think uh, South Africa failed in this, in this uh, venture? My first question is, you know, how, how wide did we cast our net? But I think there's also a little bit of a, a challenge, and I mean, you, you, you're working for a multinational anyway, is around being able to to get our international <coughs> arms to be able to take on take on that 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 kind of IP role. If I, if I could just put a, a swing basket around it, but you know, to take on that. But then, how do we keep it as a, as a local product? I think becomes very very difficult. Um, I think an, an, another interesting source that will start growing, and, and I noticed my colleague has is, is joined at the back there, around crowdsource funding for these type of in, in, initiatives. And I think it's, it's, it's still new in the whole healthcare space, but I think it, it will become a, a more interesting uh, opportunity for smaller people starting to do some of that research in, in, in South Africa. Uh, we are using the mobile technology to manage the diseases of lifestyle. And we know that South Africa has got 50 million people and 16 million, 16 million, 16 percent have got medical aid. They access the nice programs like Vitality. So it is 84 million, they don't have that access. And why I'm saying that is because we know that uh, our clinics in terms of um, resources and access, we are challenged because you don't rock up at a clinic and, and say that you want a basic screening. Screening of blood pressure, sugar, cholesterol. You don't just, the clinics are overloaded and there's shortage of staff. So as a result, we've got a, a huge avalanche of an epidemic that is silent, that is uh, within us. Okay, it has become number one killer in the world, especially in developing countries because of, res of lack of resources. Now we are managing the, a certain sector of the market, the employed but uninsured because that's where we can navigate fast and quick with companies, register and we can manage. But I would like to, to know how do we um, create a continuum with the farmer, the big farmers, because ultimately they need medica chronic medication. I like to know if there is a, next, a, a research that is being done with lifestyle diseases with the big farmers and uh, also the need to collaborate because we are doing that on our own at the corner as a group of practitioners and from us as health tech, you know, with technology managing it. It works because majority of these clients have got mobile phones and we interact and we intervene directly, engage with them. It's a very beautiful program because it access the patients right there <coughs> and they access the screening because they can, not only they can access through the government clinic, but the resources are not there. They access through our collective collaboration with a network of clinics around the country, especially the retail uh, pharmacy clinics where they do and the information, the biometrics are translocated to our platform and we manage. But it's uh, employee specific, it's an employee uh, uh, program. So I would like to know from the big farmer 
that there is a, a you know if there is an extensive a research done in terms of lifestyle diseases, so that we can collaborate. We don't work at a corner alone. Yeah, I also think so because the last research that was done it was in preparation of the new SEMSA guidelines. Of which it was just briefly check in, in, in the current molecules that are available in the, at the moment that are they working or not. And that was specifically for, for diabetes, so it doesn't include all the lifestyle diseases. So I'm not aware of a new study that's actually encompassing all the lifestyle diseases. Because I know for a fact, um, mm. from an ARB perspective, they now, normally the products from the public sector goes to the various depots and from there is distributed to the clinics and hospitals and so forth. But they're now going to implement a system where they're going to, from a distribution perspective, they're going to do it through, it hasn't been legislated, uh, they're going to do it through the big uh, courier pharmacies. So specifically ARB, there's a stigma attached to that, so people wouldn't like to go to the clinics and so forth, they go to the doctors. So what are you doing from a distribution perspective? Uh, they would take the product to the patient at home. So that's the initiative and projects that they're working on currently. There are, there are, if for example, it's two big or three, uh, the Opti Farm and the, the, the Medipos, mm. as well as a, a courier pharmacy, a pharmacy direct. So that's what they, they're planning to do. I think there are two big opportunities here. Yeah, one is around task shifting in terms of the actual diagnosis of the conditions anyway. You don't have to be a nurse to administer a diabetes test. So how is it that we take those rare clinical resources and leave them in the clinics that they need to, but task shift that actual testing to other individuals to be able to do it? But I think the, the, the one massive opportunity is for more push education to the patient themselves, irrespective of who's providing the product that they're taking. It might be pre-actual pre medication, so understanding what it is. Because again, if you don't understand your condition, you are less likely to be able to adapt it. So as you well know, as soon as you, you get diagnosed with diabetes, you, they provide you with medication, but they automatically put you onto hypertensive drugs. One of the biggest contraindication of, of most of those drugs is not to eat grapefruit. I only found that out by, by mistake. But you know, that's a massive thing if you don't know about it. So it's just educating patients. And I think that's where we, we've got to drive more accountability down to patients to take some sort of ownership for their conditions as well, especially in these, these lifestyle diseases. I'm the acting CEO of Dr. Josh Mukar Academic Hospital in Frankfurt. The question that the gentleman asked, why is the research taken outside the country? South Africa has become a consumer market, basically. And it's a question of trust. We, as South Africans, don't trust ourselves. And the big researchers are led by multinationals. And when there's an opportunity to make very serious money, those researchers will be taken out of the country because it has to do with money. It has to do with dollars, it has to do with pounds, it has to do with euros. I don't know if the Chinese uh, you know, yuan is involved, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so so as, as long as we, we are constantly creating a consumerism market in South Africa and taking out the intellectual property or innovations outside the country, it's going to continue until we take a, a very more patriotic front attitude, I don't know. But, but that's, for me, that's a tragedy that we are going down the slide of being a seriously consumer-driven South Africa, where any innovation goes to China, to USA, USA, whatever. So until we have a paradigm shift and patriotic thinking, maybe, I think we might have these innovations retained in South Africa. There's a rumor that says even the Ebola treatment was initiated here and taken to the US. I don't know, it's a rumor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.